Welcome back, young people. We have another exciting lesson for you guys. Our lesson is entitled, Jesus Heals a Centurion Servant. The time of the lesson is AD 28. The place is Capernaum. <clears throat> the golden text is when Jesus heard these things, he said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And that comes from Luke 7 and verse 9. And in our lesson, the purpose of our lesson is to show a great example of faith in Jesus being lived out and the healing and restor and the healing and restoration released as a, as a result. Jesus has an authority over sickness and death. Have you ever felt completely unworthy to have the Lord do anything for you? The key character in this week's text felt that way, but he found out that Jesus did not look at his unworthiness but rather his heart. And that is the important thing, young people, that Jesus doesn't look at status, doesn't care where you came from. He looks directly to your heart. The centurion's understanding um, that he had no greatness in him and could not even solve his own problems led him to put his hope and trust in Jesus. Instead, as he humbly asked Jesus for help, his faith had an amazing restorative fruit amazing restorative fruit in his life and in the life of his dear friend. And so also, young people, it's important to note that despite, you know, what you think that you can do or whatever, um, and in that case of our lesson today, the centurion had a lot of power, but even in the power that he had, it wasn't enough for him to, to save his friend. And so he looked to something bigger than himself. And he looked into some, he looked towards something that was was uh, that had authority over sickness and over disease and over death, and so he sought he sought that out. God was faith. <clears throat> God uses faith to bring forth restoration in our lives in all manner of ways. So again, God can use your situation. He can use your situation. He can use your faith in that situation. Um, to bring restoration. Uh, you may be going through something and, and you may be up against it or you may be at your wit's end, but if you continue to stand on your faith, um, you, will, you will see that God will bless you through that situation and you'll find yourself out on the other side having a testimony that you can now tell to others about how God carries you through. <clears throat> In this week's lesson, we will see one man who understood Jesus' healing power as he trusted in the person of Jesus and not just in a force or in an outcome. The man's faith was a vehicle used by God to bring healing to the man in need. So again, he didn't even, and, and we're going to get into it, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but again, it was his faith that would event, that would allow it was his faith that would allow for his friend to receive the healing that he was seeking for him because he believed. And again, um, we're going to see in this lesson and it's, and it's, and it's, it's so important, young people, um, to, to, to have people in your lives that think that, that think that, uh, think that of enough of you that they will beseech God for you. And, and you may have someone in your life that you too, are beseeching God for because they may be going through their own um, trial or they may be going through their own sickness, but you are on your knees and you are beseeching God to earnestly bring them out of the situation that they may find themselves in. And as we get into our lesson today and a couple of things that I want you all to, to take with you. And one, we see faith exhibited by a man who was not a part of the tribe of Israel. Uh, this man was a Roman centurion. Um, we're going to find out a little bit more about a centurion and everything that goes with that. But he was not a, he was not a child of Israel. Uh, he didn't grow up with all of the prophets, and he didn't have all of the experiences that the children of Israel had 
and how God had blessed them throughout their history. Here was a man who was coming out of a, um, you know, the Roman um, religious uh, hierarchy had a bunch of idol gods. So for this man to, to have faith in the true and living God really just shows one that God, uh, you know, when, when you have, or, or in, in his case, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but in his case, he had heard about all that Jesus had done. Um, and when you think about his role as a centurion, he was, in fact, in charge in this area. So he was uniquely aware of who Jesus was. And even though he didn't have uh, or he didn't grow up learning and, and, and knowing all about or learning about Jesus or God, the true and living God, when he heard these things, he believed. And, and so as we are going through our lives, it's important for us to not have people, uh, especially, you know, people who are just coming into the faith to have more faith than you do, especially if you've been on this journey a while. Again, you know, as your teacher, I don't look at your age um, as, as some type of barometer. You guys, some of you all have been walking this walk for a while. So, you know, you shouldn't allow for people. It's even non-Christians. You know, as Christians, we should have the right amount of faith in any situation that comes up. We shouldn't see outsiders having more faith in a situation than we do. And so as we look at the request, and, and another thing too, uh, we're going to see in this lesson that Jesus responds in a way that he doesn't respond in any, uh, any other part in scripture, we're going to see how he responds to this man's faith. And, and we're going to see him do something that is not seen anywhere else in scripture as well. So more on that later on in the lesson. And um, again, I want to introduce myself. My name is Bruce. And we're going to jump right into our first five verses are under the subtitle, uh, subtitle The Request, which is, covers Luke 7, 1 through 5. And as we look at our first verse, now, when he had ended all his sayings and the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. So now Jesus had uh, at this point, he was in the countryside teaching and preaching and healing and, and ministering um, to the people. He wanted to be out in the country because he wanted to be able to affect more people. And so as his day was winding down, Capernaum was uh, or Capernaum, Capernaum was a place where he would go and, 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 and kind of unwind, if you will, and kind of relax. As we look at verse 2, And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And see, one thing that we should note, young people, a centurion was, was, was granted um, several things you know, in the position that he held. And one of those things was he was granted personal servants. And under the Roman custom, you know, slaves were not really given, you know, a whole lot of respect or due. Um, they were viewed upon as inter as replaceable. Um, there were some cases, or it was not unlawful for a Roman master to kill a, a, a servant or slave that was ill or unable to perform um, job duties. So, um as you sit, as we as we look at the relationship that the centurion had with his servant, we kind of see why he was so uh, desperate, if you will, to to find any means to to save his life. And again, like I said, as he as he was dear to him, so again, the relationship was more than just master and servant. Um, there was something deeper, and and again, unfortunately, this this servant had fallen sick, sick. Um, and Matthew, we learned, we learned that he had a form of palsy um, that was really tormenting him. And he was ready to die. As we look at verse 3, And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. So now here the centurion thought to himself, Well, I keep hearing about this man, Jesus. I keep hearing about all the things that he's done. Um, let me send 
um, some of these Jewish leaders to him to see if I can to see if they can convince him to come and 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 speak a word over my servant. So, you know, he went to his friends in the Jewish community, and you see them going and 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 then we'll see in the verse in, in verse uh, four we'll see how they went and answered the call for the centurion. And as we look at verse four, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. So again, you know, they didn't delay, right? Um, he asked them to go for him to speak for his servant. Um, now, and, and it's also important to note that these two groups didn't really get along really, to be honest with you. Again, how would um, a group that's being occupied feel about those that were occupying them? And that was a relationship that you saw between the Romans and the, and the, and the nation of Israel. Um, and, and so they would have these, these feelings of animosity towards each other. So to see that the centurion had enough respect among the Jewish leaders for them to immediately go and, and, and fulfill the, the request that he had. And then not only did they fulfill the request, um, they, 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 they spoke glowingly about him. He's worthy. This, this is a good man. This is not, he's not like these other Romans that, that we've dealt with. He's not, uh, he doesn't treat us like we are beneath him. Doesn't treat us like we're nothing. You know, we're going to get into some preceding verses or actually we're going to get into our next verse, verse five, where we see for he loveth our nation and he hath built us a synagogue. So, again, as he has shown respect, more respect than 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 previous centurions or even previous uh, Roman officials to the Jewish people, they, he also uh, took the time to build a synagogue for them, a place for them to go and worship. You know, he he respected their religion enough that he made sure that they had a place to worship in. So again, if, if that doesn't tell you um, about his character and, and how he felt about the people that he was over, um, and then, you know, I don't know what will, but what we do see is that his respect, his love for them um, allowed for those Jewish leaders whether or not they were religious leaders or civic leaders is 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 up for debate, but they still went forth and they request and they they fulfilled the request that the the centurion had again showing their level of respect for this particular Roman at a time where they didn't have a lot of respect for those Roman um, occupiers. So as we jump back in, as I said earlier, the request in this week's text. Jesus had just finished giving a long sermon or discourse. He had talked about the importance of not only hearing his words on people. That's important. It's important not only as you're reading your Bible, you're hearing the words that you're speaking, but of also believing them enough to put them into practice. Again, don't just read the word, but do the word or put it into practice. <clears throat> he also had discussed how all that a man does proceeds from what was what is in his heart so a good heart of faith will produce good work so again everything starts here you know if you are good in your heart then you're going to produce good fruits if your heart produces evil or wickedness or if your heart is black you're going to produce bad fruit it's bad fruit bad things are going to come for you because again that's 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 what you have in your heart so again this is why you hear the older folks say, guard your heart. Excuse me. You need to guard your heart. You need to protect your heart from, from those attacks that can come from the enemy at various times as he tries to, to separate you uh, from that relationship that you're having, the relationship that you're establishing with Christ and kind of throw you in disarray. Jesus had been preaching out of the, out in the countryside so that more people could hear him but once he had finished, he went into the city Capernaum. 
Jesus did a good deal of ministry in, ministry in the city and often returned there after traveling. It was a Jewish city, but there was also a large Gentile presence because of the Roman garrison that was stationed there. And, and then what we also learn about this city is that this was um, um, a city by the sea, or the Sea of Galilee, if I'm not mistaken. And it was the largest city. So again, have, being in a place where trade um, is happening, uh, is flowing freely, um, you're gonna, obviously there's gonna be a lot of wealth in that city. So obviously you have wealth, you have trade there, you're gonna find and occupying people wanting to make sure that their presence, you know, is kind of felt. Um, the leader of this garrison, this the leader of this garrison, a centurion, is the key figure in the miracle of Jesus in this text. A centurion was a Roman unit commander of fairly high rank. The term is related to the word century and indicates that a centurion would have around 100 men at his command. So again, here was a man who commanded uh, at least a hundred men. Um, he was a man of high rank, you know. So this wasn't just a a a, a low uh, a lowly rank officer, you know. He he was a man of status, um, if you will. He would also be afforded other luxuries. He would also be afforded, excuse me, other luxuries of being an officer, such as having a personal having personal servants. The centurion in Capernaum, Capernaum had one servant who excelled the rest in value, but the servant fell deathly ill. And again, as I said earlier, it was important to note that he saw past his, quote, value as a, as a servant, as a piece of property, and, and saw more to his value um, as a man. Um, uh, again, he valued his service more than the, than the, than, 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 um, um, than, than, than the price, or if you will, of what a, a servant would have cost. And at that point, he didn't have to pay a thing. The centurion showed a good heart by caring more about, uh, more about the servant as a person than about him service. I'm sorry. So again, as I said, as I was trying to say, he cared more about his as a person than he did about the service that he did for him. And he was saddened by the servant's illness. The centurion learned about Jesus, whose reputation and renown as a healer and teacher have been growing in the area because of his frequent visits there. So as I said, again, he wouldn't be worth his salt as a centurion if he didn't have intelligence about the comings and goings of the city that he was in charge of. <clears throat> he was known for healing all, the, all who came to him. And as he had, in fact, been doing just before uh, preaching the sermon that directly precedes this last, uh, this story, Luke six seventeen through nineteen. The centurion chose respected leaders in the Jewish community to deliver his message, perhaps wanting to show Jesus, even though he was a foreigner, he respected the Jews and their customs. So again, you know, another part of this lesson that we see. Again, with this this Roman centurion who, you know, did not have to show the humility that he was showing. Again, he could have easily commanded his soldiers to go and get Jesus and and bring him, you know, into his presence. But again, um, his respect for the children of Israel allowed for him to say, well, can you all go and, and ask him to come versus me? forcing him to come. So again, you see the humility, the humbleness that he's showing, even though, again, he has the authority to send for and have brought to him anyone that he wants. <clears throat> there was always tension between the native Jews and the occupying Romans, but the centurion wanted to bridge that gap. So again, as I said earlier, they did not like each other. Again, Generally, you're not going to like the people that are occupying your homeland. You're not going to like the people that that have you, um, quite frankly, under their thumb, that are, are, are watching and governing your everyday life. <clears throat> the leaders who came to Jesus on the centurion's behalf gave two reasons for Jesus to bless him. 
The first reason they said that he loved the Jewish nation, probably meaning that he showed respect for their culture and customs and did not strictly enforce the Roman rule in this area. So again, this man was benevolent. Um, this, this man was, um, again, not heavy handed, not forcing, you know, Roman culture on on the Jewish people, just allowing them to to live about their day to day lives. The second reason they gave seems to support this idea. Apparently, the centurion, excuse me, had gone so far as to build the people of the city a synagogue. It was a very significant step, young people, and showed that he had a heart of blessing toward the people. It showed that Luke wanted the people to know that this centurion was a good man. So again, as we know, uh, this is the book of Luke. Luke was the writer, and and so he's he's showing that again. He, he, he's, he, he's showing you that he's not your typical centurion. He's not your typical Roman who has uh, come into this area and again is now um, um, ruling over a particular area. <clears throat> As we look at the explanation, which is going to cover uh, Luke 7 verses 6 and 8. And as we look at verse 6, then Jesus went with them and he was and he was now not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble, ye, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. So again, you know, um, you may be asking yourself, young people, well, wait a minute. You know, he just sent the Jewish leaders to go and get Jesus to, you know, come and, and, and heal his friend or heal his servant. And yet now we see he's sending his friends to go and say, hey, you know, he's not worthy. No, you don't need to come into his home. No, um, you know, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that I'm worthy enough. And, and again, um, young people, as we look at this verse, you just see again his humbleness, him not thinking that he's worthy enough. Him not thinking he's worthy to be in the presence of, of the of the true and living God, you know, and then also him respecting Jesus enough, because, again, as I as I said earlier, there was animosity between the Romans and the children of Israel. If a if a if an Israelite went into the house of a Gentile. Now, this wasn't God's law. God never told them this, but they they through their own little rights basically would, would declare someone to be unclean. And so the, the centurion is probably thinking to himself, you know, I don't want Jesus to have to go through that hassle. I don't want these uh, people to, you know, try to use that against him to, you know, try to mess with his ministry because he had the audacity, you know, to come and, and, and enter into a Gentile's home, even though we're going to see Jesus came for everybody. You know, he yes, he came for the Jews first, but, you know, the plan was always for everyone, everyone to be a part or everyone to take part in the blessing that is Jesus. So, again, him having that much respect for Jesus, him feeling that level of humility to say that I'm not worthy. Yeah, I know I sent for you, but, you know, no, I don't I don't I don't I don't I don't need you to come into my house and, and we're going to see here. Uh, young people in verse seven, when he says, wherefore, neither I, excuse me, wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word and my servants shall be healed. So he's like, listen, I, I don't think that I'm worthy enough for you to come in my house. And I didn't think that I was worthy enough to come and personally ask this of you. But all you have to do, all you got to do is just say the word. Say the word and then my servant is going to be healed. And see, young people, it's in this moment that his faith is at his greatest, right? He's saying, you, I don't, it doesn't matter where you are. You could be around the corner or you could be 10 miles away. All you have to do is say he is healed and he is healed. And so the, and so the centurion is like, don't even bother. I believe enough in you that you can just say the word. As we look at verse 8, 
For I am also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. So again, he's using the, the, he's using the life that he's in as a commander in, a Rome, in the Roman army to say that, listen, I understand that as, as a man under authority, if, if one of my commanding officers tell me to do something, then I do it as if the commanding officer is right here on the scene. And if I tell one of the men under me to do something, to go, he's going to go without question. If I tell someone to come, they're going to come without question. And if I say to my servant, I need you to do this, it's going to be done. Whether or not I'm there physically to see that it is done, it is going to be done because that's my word. And so he's saying, and, and again, as we, if we go back into verse 7, he's saying that you have the authority over that life and death and over disease and sickness that all you simply have to do is say a word. And, and, and young people, it's important to note again that he had been, this is either his, uh, he's either in his uh, first or second year of ministry. Again, we're in AD 28. Um, we know that he died in AD 30. We know that his ministry lasted for three years. So in the time that he's been preaching and ministering and healing, this is the message that he's been trying to, to give to his, to his disciples, to the apostles, to the people that were following him. And yet here it was, it took a Gentile, a Roman centurion to get the message that all you have to do is believe and have enough faith that it can be done regardless of the situation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as we go back to the explanation, again, that covers seven uh, for Luke 7, 6 through 8. After hearing the earnest plea of the leaders, the, uh, Jesus decided to go with them to the centurion's house. He did not say anything about healing the sick man, but he went with them. I think that's important to note. He heard their plea. He didn't say anything. He just went with them. He loved the best blessed people and certainly, excuse me, needed less convincing than they would have imagined, even though he was quick to acknowledge that his first ministry, as I said earlier, was to the Jews. But here was an open or here was an open door to bless both Jews and Gentiles. So again, Jesus took this opportunity to one, to show the Jews that, first of all, uh, listen, I don't care about their racial background. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't, that has no bearing to me. His faith, his faith is going to allow for me to do what he's requesting. And then for the, for the Gentile, for the Gentiles, he's going to, they're going to see, well, this man, this Jewish man, this man, this man from the children of Israel, well, he has the power of life and death in him. And he's someone that we can put our faith in. Before they made it to the house, the centurion sent his own friends to tell Jesus not to worry about taking the, uh, excuse me, taking the trouble to come. It seems clear that he was uncertain of his status before Jesus. Again, he was humble. I don't want to trouble you if it's going to be a trouble. I don't want you to have to deal with the harassment that is surely going to come from your uh, fellow countrymen the moment that you enter into my home or the moment that you deal with me, especially me, a, a Roman centurion who, you know, again, is probably the most hated um, of, the, of the Roman occupiers, um, obviously next to the soldiers that are carrying out the orders of the centurions or the orders of the, um, the governors that may be in place. Um, at that time, <clears throat> it is very significant that the centurion had his messengers address Jesus as Lord. Even though the Roman was the leader in the area, he deferred and showed respect to Jesus. Again, as I said earlier, young people, here's a man that showed respect when generally most of them wouldn't. You know, it's as simple as that. He had more respect for Jesus than any other centurion before him. That so much respect 
that he made sure that his friends, when they addressed him, they addressed him as Lord. And he made sure that his friends, again, his authority was such that when he told his, when he sent his friends, they addressed him the way he told them to address him, address him, Lord, give him his proper respect and give him the, uh, again, give him the respect due to his name. He also indicated <clears throat> that the sickness he so badly wanted to end was in the realm of Jesus's jurisdiction. So again, he believed in his heart that Jesus can heal this man from wherever he was. Not his own, not, not his own. His humility was very, is very surprising for a Roman officer and indicated that he must really, or he might really believe that Jesus was sent from God. So again, here's a man who didn't grow up with the prophets, didn't grow up hearing the stories, but he had heard about what Jesus was doing. And, 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 and from what he heard, it possibly gave him or allowed for him to believe that despite everything that he was taught coming up as a Roman citizen, that this, this Jesus here, he was the true and living God. Under the customs of, the, of, the, of Jewish ritual law, and again, as I said earlier, this wasn't God's law. This was Jewish ritual law. If a Jew entered the home of a Gentile, he would become unclean, just as the Gentiles were considered unclean. He would be excluded from worshiping at the temple until the proper ceremony had been performed to cleanse him. So they went as far as to bar you, if you were a Jew that went inside the home of a Gentile, from temple worship, from offering sacrifices, from doing any of those things until you went through the proper um, cleansing process, which, again, this was their ritual law. This was not something that God established or God put into place. The centurion did not want to put Jesus through the aggravation. He did not consider himself worthy to have Jesus endure that for his sake. He deeply desired, young people, an audience with Jesus, but he did not think he was worthy of one. Again, going back to his humility. Yes, I could make you come. I could send soldiers and they will force you to come and see me. But I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm, 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 I'm humbling myself because... For one, I'm asking something of you. I don't want to force you to come in and do something because that may affect if it, whether or not you, you do what it is I'm asking you to do. I'd much, rather, I'd much rather go about it peaceably. I'd much rather ask you politely than force you. <clears throat> However, even though the centurion doubted himself... And his worthiness, he never doubted, young people, the power and goodness of Jesus. In fact, his lack of confidence in himself may have led him to depend on Jesus even more. Again, his, his beloved servant was dying. He, he, he was, it was not looking good. He was on death's door. And, and despite the fact that he had authority to command this one to go this way, that one to do that, and someone else to do something else, he didn't have the power to bring his friend back from death's door. So in that moment, he recognized his own weakness. And, and again, the, it, you know, as we parallel to, to today, as you are going through your storm, the moment that you recognize your own weakness, that you're not strong enough, that's when that that's when your faith is, is strengthened. When you say, all right, God, I tried. I attempted to do this in my strength and it didn't work. And so now I'm asking you, I'm beseeching you if it's your will. And that's also something important to um, young people that we don't get discouraged. If we ask God to save a loved one, to heal someone that is sick, sometimes it's not his will. Sometimes the answer is no, I'm ready for them to come home. And we just have to be able to, understand and respect that and know that yes he does have the power to heal and bring back from the dead but it's also his will it's his timing <clears throat> in an unparalleled request in an unparalleled request in scripture he asked Jesus and this is one of those things that I talked about in the beginning of the lesson this is something that has not that did, had that had not 
happened up to this point, and I do not believe it happened after this um, in our in our lesson that we see in the, in the scriptures. <clears throat> he asked Jesus to speak an authoritative word to from wherever he was, believing that he it it would be enough to heal his suffering servant. So again, as I said, he just said, "Listen, you don't 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 waste your time." Wherever you are, just say the word. I I believe, I don't care if no one else believes, I believe earnestly that if you just say the word, just like if I send word through one of my subordinates that it's going to be taken care of, regardless of whether or not I'm there, you can say the word, Jesus, and this servant will be healed. This would suggest that the man was doing that. Excuse me. This would suggest that the man was doing more than showing simple respect to Jesus. He was ascribing a power to him that could only be considered divine. So again, he recognized. I've heard about the stuff that he's done. He has to be divine. There's no one else that can that can that can that can remedy this situation other than this man. This is the man that I need to see. This is the man that I need to speak a word in order for my friend, my servant to be healed. The centurion's messengers went on to explain his rationale for this bold request. When he ordered, excuse me, when he ordered a thing to be done, he did not have to be present, as I said just a, uh, a second ago, to know that it would be done according to his word. For all this, the centurion reasoned that if Jesus truly had authority over sickness, he would not need to be where the sickness was to heal it, and he would not have to do anything but speak a command to end it. Again, he humbled himself and recognized at the same time Jesus' power as superior to his power. As we look at the response, which covers Luke 7, verses 9 through 10, young people, and as we look at verse 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Listen, young people, this is a truly, truly amazing verse right here because one, Jesus doesn't speak this way about anybody else in Scripture. And not only that, Again, this is a Roman citizen, a centurion. He's not a child of Israel. He's not one of his disciples, not one of his apostles. He is a Gentile and he turns to the people. So again, even as Jesus is trying to rest and, 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 and relax, he still has people following him. And again, he uses this moment to teach, to turn around and say to those people following him, my God, I've not seen anything like this in the entire time that I've been ministering. I've not seen such great faith anywhere at any time. And to truly see, to see Jesus truly marvel at this Roman, it just goes to show he looks past rank, status, ethnic background, Again, straight to the heart, straight to the heart. I know what he's saying is true because I, he, again, Jesus, look, God looks past your words. Words sound good. You can say what you want, but man, if your faith isn't strong, do you really believe what you're saying? Because again, this is a faith thing. It was his faith that allowed for his servant to be healed. His faith that allowed him to send those messengers two times out to Jesus. That faith, that, that step, that extra step that he took to ensure that his friend would not, that he would do everything in his power to ensure that his servant didn't die. As we look at verse 10, and they that went and they that were sent 
returned to the house, found the servant old that had been sick. So by the time the second group got back, or by the time they got back, these messengers, he was whole. He was sitting up. He was probably eating, uh, maybe even walking around. Maybe, you know, who knows, maybe even dancing and shouting for joy. Who knows? But they found this man healthy and whole by the time that they returned back. So again, Jesus healed that man where he was standing based on that faith that that centurion had. And as we look at the response, this man caused Jesus to marvel and be amazed, a compliment not given to anyone else in scripture. Jesus honored him not for his status, but for his faith, as I said earlier. In fact, Jesus stopped right then and turned around to tell everyone how highly he thought of this man's faith. Jesus said that he had never run across such great faith in his entire ministry, young people. He especially emphasized that even in Israel, nothing like this could be found. So again, even though he went to them first, it was a Gentile. It was a Gentile. That had, that had that level of faith that would cause him to marvel. Jesus said that he had never run across such great faith in his entire ministry, especially emphasized that even in Israel, nothing like this could be found. I'm sorry. Jesus' words showed that God is not concerned about outward things like racial heritage, but about inward things like the condition of your heart, as I said earlier. The man was worthy of honor, not because of his social standing, but because of his faith alone. Again, his money wasn't going to get it done. His rank wasn't going to get it done. It was his faith. It's the same thing for us today. Listen, I don't care how strong you think you are. I don't care how much money your parents have. I don't care what kind of resources you have. Ultimately, in order for you to get through the situation that you find yourself in, it's going to take your faith, great faith, the faith of you, the faith of your loved ones and those around you. That's, that's how you get out of the situation. There is more, there is more to Jesus' unique response. Matthew records Jesus' message to him, and, and, and you have to love this, young people. As thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee again as thou hast believeth so be it done unto thee again his faith his faith his faith right there that faith right there and you and you see you know um young people throughout uh Jesus's ministry you see him dealing with gentiles and you see him um um Blessing them because of the faith that they have and, and, and not being afraid to say, hey, I believe in you and I believe in who you are. And I know that you're the only one that can take care of or deal with this situation that I'm having to deal with. <clears throat> Jesus showed that he could do exactly what the centurion requested and he healed the sick servant from a distance, another thing not seen elsewhere in scripture. Again, like I said, young people, there were two things, two things in this lesson that were not seen elsewhere in scripture. The first was the fact that he <clears throat> marveled at the faith of a Gentile or any other person at that, of that matter. But he marveled at the faith of a, faith of a Gentile. And the second was that he healed his servant. From where he was. When they asked when the man had been healed, it was exactly at the time when Jesus spoke. The Gentile centurion's faith in Jesus' authority was richly rewarded. Again, as you believeth, so it be done unto thee. His faith allowed for his servant to be healed. Again, I, I, I've said it repeatedly throughout this lesson. It is your faith. That is going to allow for you to make it through the situation that you may find yourself in. As we look at real life applications, young people, 
The key lesson from this text is that our own unworthiness does not make Jesus loves us any less. I'm going to say that again. Our own unworthiness does not make Jesus love us any less. Just because we're not worthy, unworthy because of the sin that we were all born into doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that Jesus is not right now interceding on your behalf, saying to God, I died for that. Forgive him or her for that because I died. I took on that sin. I took on that curse. He's interceding right now on everyone's behalf that believes in him. <clears throat> the centurion from the lesson felt unworthy of Jesus' attention, but he believed strongly that Jesus could do what he needed. So again, he was humble enough to say, I'm not worthy to be in your presence, but he believed strongly enough that Jesus could do what he asked, what he requested of him. Jesus was not concerned about whether the man was worthy of his help or not. In fact, none of us are worthy, as we just said, of God's help, for we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That comes from Romans 3 and 23. Again, that's why no one can boast or brag. We were all fallen. We were all sinners before God called us and brought us to the light. Knowing this fact, however, should make us all the quicker to rely on Jesus' love and power, like the centurion, anything good we've had, and you've heard me say this, young people, in previous lessons, but anything good we have has been given to us by Jesus, and they, and this, young people, should give us faith that he can and will continue to give us good things that we need. Amen. So again, Everything good you have comes from the Lord. Everything. And so as your faith strengthens, as, as your relationship deepens with him, as your walk uh, becomes more uh, deeper and, 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 and all of those things, you see him continuously blessing you, continuously carrying you, continuously helping you through the storms, through those trials, through those tests that might come. <clears throat> this lesson gives us a powerful example of faith in action. The centurion believed in the power of Jesus. And then he acted in a way that backed up his belief. Again, he heard about Jesus. He heard about all the healing and, and stuff. He sent, his, he sent the Jewish leaders out to beseech him. To, 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 to implore him, to earnestly get him to come and speak a word over this servant. And he, and he put, again, he put it into action. He didn't just, he didn't just say, okay, well, I think it can be done. He believed. He didn't think he believed it could be done. And guess what, young people? It was done. He could have believed all day that Jesus could have, uh, that Jesus could heal his servant, but that faith would have been worthless unless he actually reached out to Jesus. So again, that's what we mean by putting his faith in action. Yes, he had heard and yes, he had be he, he believed. But again, just sitting on his couch, hoping that Jesus might pass by and that he might be able to shout and say, hey, can you speak a word over this servant that is dying? Well, that, that may not come to fruition. <clears throat> He actually reached out to Jesus and asked for help. The same is true for us. Sometimes we do not get the blessings we want simply because we do not believe Jesus wants to give them to us, at least not enough, not enough to ask them, ask him for them. Listen, young people, you have not because you ask not. That's in scripture. Whatever you request, go to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord with prayer. Listen, you may... It may be his will to give you what you're requesting. It may be his will to say that you got to wait. And it may be his will to say, no, you're just not ready for whatever it is you're asking for. But you can take your request to, to the Lord and prayer and whatever his will is for that request. Well, it'll be known to you. But again, you got to ask. You can't get mad and say, well, what God didn't do for you if you didn't ask. It's the same thing, you know. As you deal with 
your folks. You can't get mad at your parents about something that you don't ask for. You see something you like, but you're scared to ask for it. If you're scared to ask for it, then they're never going to know that you want it. Again, same thing with Christ. If you want something, you got to open your mouth and pray for it and ask God for it. Our faith is tested when it comes time. Our faith is tested when it comes time to act on it. But when we do see that Jesus loves to bless us with his restorative and healing power and love. So again, sometimes when, it, when, it, when, when it's time to act, that's when you see how strong your faith is, right? And again, as you see Jesus blessing, as you see God blessing you, that's when your faith and, and you see it, it grows, when you see that, as I said, restorative power and healing power, right? He restored you from a situation or his power healed you or he healed you from some sickness or he healed a loved one um, that you care deeply about. When you see those things happen, you, you again, your faith is strengthened. You know that when the next time something comes up, you know, I don't have to worry because he's already done something in the past for me. He's already blessed me. He's already shown me that he has the power and authority over whatever may come into my life to, to just simply speak a word and it's done. Another truth from this passage is that Jesus will use the circumstances of our lives to speak to us in ways we can understand. The centurion understood how authority worked in the Roman chain of command. That's why it made sense to him that Jesus' authority over sickness and death was so far reaching. For example, if we have good fathers, God can use that to teach us about his fatherly love. So again, as we saw in our lesson, the centurion used his own training to explain why he thought that Jesus had the authority to do what he was requesting. Again, God can use whatever situation it is or whatever situation you're in to um, um, to, to speak to us again, wherever you are, you could be athlete. Um, you could be someone that's into drama. You could be someone that's into, you know, art or music or whatever it is, but God can use that situation again to, to, to speak with, to speak to you in a way that you understand or to make it plain, right? Uh, God is not a God of confusion. So when he speaks to you, He's not going to speak to you in riddles, right? He's not trying to, to trick you or trip you up. He's going to come to you. He's going to meet you at your level. So again, that's one thing that you that we all love about God is that he meets us at our level where we are and uses the situation situations that we are in to, to explain to us or to get us uh, to, to, to bless our faith, to help it grow and help it develop. Um, as we continue on in this Christian walk. And so again, young people, I want to thank you all for, for watching and subscribing to these videos. I want to apologize for my voice. Um, um, it, is, is, uh, it is fading on me, but um, again, we will not let that stop us from bringing these messages to you. You guys are truly, truly amazing. Um, you guys are watching these videos at record pace. Uh, and I just want to say again, thank you. And as we normally do, we want to take this opportunity to ask for those who are not believers. Again, it doesn't matter how old you are. Um, you can give your life to the Lord at any age, right? Heaven is ready to rejoice for you the same way it's ready to rejoice for the adults, right? All you need to do, young people, is, is confess with your tongue and believe in your heart that Jesus died and that he was buried and he was raised after three days. That he's defeated death for all time. He's defeated sin for all time. He's granted us uh, access to God himself, God the Father. All you have to do is accept him into your heart. Believe in him. Accept him as your personal savior. And again, heaven is ready to rejoice in you. Heaven is ready to, uh, God is ready to seal your name in the Lamb's book of life. He's ready to give you a new hope. He's ready to breathe into you and give you a new spirit. And so again, 
I want you to take this opportunity, young people, to consider this lesson, to consider the faith that you saw in the centurion, to consider the humility that he showed, to consider the fact that in his own strength he knew he couldn't do it, that he recognized the power that Jesus had, and he put his faith in God. He didn't put his faith in man. He put his faith in God. So as you're going through your daily life, as you're going through your week this week, I just want you to put this lesson into practical use in your daily life. Again, remember, Jesus has the authority over everything. Jesus can speak a word, and that situation can be done just like that. So until the next time, young people, I want to say that I love you. I appreciate you. Continue sharing. Tell your friends. Tell your parents. We do an adult video as well. But until the next time, we'll see you back again on the corner, JMG Corner Ministries. Until next time, God bless. Great is life.